Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast, officially sponsored by Running Aces Casino and Racetrack. I'm your host, Steve Fredland, and today I am going to continue building my pre-flop ranges early in tournaments. We've looked at when it's folded to me, we've looked at when there's one or more limpers before me, and today I'm going to consider what to do when there is a raise in front of me. So I am excited to share all of that. First, a couple of quick things about the training that we have launched, and then I'll talk more about uh, some of this stuff later in the episode, but just a few, co- a couple of things. As I mentioned last time, we have launched these live training seminars. We've got them scheduled 8 a.m. and noon, both on November 10th, both in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota, featuring some great content from Saul for Y as well as Alex Fitzgerald, so you don't want to miss out on that. Uh, seating is limited, uh, so get in touch with me if you want a seat there. I've also launched some data reporting and analytics tools, uh, a panel discussion that will be available online, as well as some email coaching. So you can get all of this information at recpokertraining.com or feel free to email me, steve at recpokertraining.com. And if you want to stay updated on all things Rec Poker, you can now sign up for the Rec Poker email newsletter. Go to recpokertraining.com. Provide your email address at the bottom of the page. And as a special thank you for signing up, you will receive the 115-page Poker Workbook Volume 1 featuring 15 interactive poker hand quizzes from Jonathan Little. It is so nice to have generous content providers and partners. So thanks to Jonathan and the crew at PokerCoaching.com for that free gift that you will get if you sign up for the Rec Poker newsletter. So I'll talk a bit more about training offerings at the end of the episode, but for now, let's get into the content. What a crazy intense few weeks of trying to build out ranges that are strategically sound while also making ranges and decisions that are more easily memorable. There are a ton of great people out there that have developed ranges, um, but what I'm trying to do is something that I believe is fairly unique. I am trying to create a system of default ranges that is actually memorable and actionable to the average recreational player. I mean, my my caveats, as always, are that I recognize these may not be perfectly optimal ranges, and I also recognize that they are just defaults. Uh, You could, and adjustments probably have to be made, uh, and many times they should be made. But the goal here is to develop a simplified set of defaults that will help me and help less, uh, less experienced players move into a place where they are running deeper into tournaments, they're avoiding busting as early as often, and making sound decisions that are not overly influenced by the emotion and pressure that happen when actually in the moment. Uh, Hopefully adding some sound logic to what can be emotional decisions. So as part of this, I continue working the communication of these things. I I keep looking for uh, labels and language that make things more simple rather than more difficult. So you're going to hear some of that incorporated here. And as with everything, I'm very open to suggestions on all of that as we continue to build, uh, hopefully, a simplified yet strategically sound strategy. So let's flash back and uh, look at what are the core ranges that we're dealing with. So in this emerging system, I have, um, I guess, created eight core ranges which I currently call range 22, 33, 44, up through range 99. And they're named after the minimum pair that's in that range. So hopefully that's easy to remember. Uh, I was having a conversation with my buddy Stacey Nelson, though, and he has started referring to them for himself as ranges 2, 5, 10, ranges 3, 6, 10, uh, ranges 9, queen, king. Um, These uh, are helping him because it it actually uh, describes each range in terms of its minimum pair, the minimum rank for two suited cards, and the minimum rank for two offsuit cards. So that's working for him. Uh, so that's another interesting approach to doing that. Uh, so I think that that's interesting. Uh, for now, I'm going to keep using my initial range labels, as that's what I'm used to. That's what's easier for me. But consider creating your own or using Stacy's, whatever works for you. And I would love to hear what you end up using there. So with these core ranges, these eight core ranges, here's the rules for determining what's in that range. Uh, uh, Pocket pairs with the range name and higher. Uh, If they're suited cards, they both must be be at least three higher than the minimum pair. Uh, The only exception here is that I will play all suited aces in ranges 22 and 33. And then if there's two offsuit unpaired cards, 
They both must be at least one above the suited requirement. And the only added condition here is that they both must be 10 or higher at all times. So, for example, in these core ranges, range 22 would be pocket twos and better, two suited cards, five and better, any ASEC suited, and any two offsuit cards, 10 and higher. And continuing to follow these, follow these rules, range 55 would then be pocket fives and better, two suited cards, eight and higher, and two offsuit cards, 10 and higher. And range 88, for example, would be pocket eights and higher, two suited cards, jack and higher, and two offsuit cards, queen and higher. So those are the eight core ranges. We've talked about them for a couple of weeks now, so uh, go back and familiarize yourself with those. And um, th these ranges, these core ranges are used by position in early stages of a tournament. So rather than considering, hey, what's my position, starting with under the gun and then thinking under the gun, under the gun plus one, under the gun plus two, et cetera, et cetera, um, the problem there is that the number of players left to act varies by the number of players that are in the hand, that are at the table. And the reality is the our hand selection should be based on how many players are left to act behind us because what we're really trying to figure out is what's the probability of somebody waking up with a big hand. So we really need to do is start determining our position starting with a button and working backwards. So that's what I'm doing. I'm considering the button uh, as sort of uh, position B, and then B minus 1 is the cutoff, B minus 2 is the hijack, B minus 3 is the low jack, et cetera, et cetera. And you really don't need to know those labels, button, cutoff, hijack, low jack, all of those things. They really don't matter. It's just if somebody's referring to it, that's what they're referring to. Um, but I'm going to consider, you know, the button, and then each one is button minus 1, button minus 2, all the way up to uh, the biggest one could be button minus 7. That would be what is considered under the gun, 10 handed. So when I'm considering the base range, uh, before the hand is even dealt, I look at the button and then I think, okay, if I was on the button, it'd be range 22. And then I go up from there. Uh, the person right after the button is 33, then 44, 55. So uh, I figure out where I'm at. I'm in range 22 or I'm in range 55 or I'm in range 66 or 33, whatever it is. I now know what my base range is, and immediately before the hand is even dealt, I should know what my playable hands are if there is no action in front of me, or if there's a limper in front of me, as we find out, it's the same playable range. So right away, I know what my range is, and now I can decide if I want to look at my hand right away or if not. Uh, I've tended to start looking at my hand right away, uh, because then I just know right away, is this in my playable range or not? If it's not, I can just uh, not worry about it. I can start paying attention to other things at the table. And if it is, now I can start that process of thinking what my action should be. So that's how I determine uh, which base range I'm at early in a tournament based on position at the table. So um, again, I'm applying this early stages. That's what Matt Hunt from the Solve for Why Academy refers to as the preservation phase. Uh, so these base ranges may change as we get deeper in tournaments. Uh, and that's something that we'll look at uh, as we get further into this thing. So as a reminder, if there's no action in front of me, I've already established what my base range is. If I'm the first to act and everyone's folded to me, I will raise with the hands that are in my base range. I'm not going to limp as the first one to vo voluntarily put chips in the middle. So I will either raise if it's in my base range or I'll fold if it's not in my base range in the early stages of a tournament. And typically, I'm going to be raising to two and a half times the big blind and never limp. So if I look at that, that means my opening ranges have the following frequencies. Um, I'm going to be opening 29% of the time on the button when it is folded around to me, 27% at the button minus one, and it's going to keep going down 27, 22%, 20%, 18%, 12%, 8%. And if I'm under the gun in a 10-handed table, my opening range would be about 5%. So we've covered those before, and I'll eventually put these into a blog so you can kind of see them as well. I know it's hard on a podcast, but uh, my widest range is 29% on the button if it's folded around to me, and I know this is much tighter than a lot of people recommend, but again, uh, early, early in a tournament, there's only one and a half big blinds in there. 
uh, I've decided that I'm going to play a lower volatility approach and uh, not go uh, crazy trying to steal that blind in half and potentially end up in a situation where I'm facing a three bet uh, because they know I'm opening wide on the button and then I end up uh, losing a lot more chips than I would have had I just folded. So that's the situation if it's folded to me now. What we talked about last time is what if there's limpers in front of me? So I shared my thoughts on what to do in this case. Um, and this was adjusted after some great feedback from both Rex and Pro. So very thankful to those of you who provided feedback. And where I landed was a strategy that kept the same base range in terms of what I would play. Uh, so uh, whether it's folded to me or whether there's limpers in front of me, if it's a hand I was going to play before, it's a hand I'm going to play now. But now that range is split into three sections, a strong raising range, and here I'm targeting the top 25% of my base range, a weak raising range, and here I'm targeting the bottom 25% of my base range, and then a limp behind range, which is really about the middle 50% of my range. And the other core piece of my desired strategy is simplicity and ease of implementation. So I spent hours working to try to hit these rough targets of splitting this range up using only my existing eight core ranges. And I was able to come up with a structure that is reasonably uh, uh, reproductive of these targets. So I'm happy with that. And again, I'm trying to balance optimal strategy and ease of implementation. So when there's limpers in front of me, the system works like this. Use the same base ranges by position to determine the hands that I'm going to play after limps. If I'm not in the base range, then I'm just going to fold, regardless of the action. Whether there's no action or whether there's limped, uh, I'm just going to fold. So it's still that same binary thing. Either it's in that playable range or it's not. So I don't need to do any additional thinking if it's outside of that base range. However, if my hand is in the base range, then I need to do the following in order to determine if I'm going to raise or limp behind. And I'm going to break these down and I have to do this in order. So first I'm going to figure out um, what is my strong raising range. And I'm going to do that by looking at that core range that's five ranges higher than my base range. Uh, again, subject to a maximum range of 99. That's my highest, uh, tightest range. So if my hand is in this strong raising range, then I'm going to raise two and a half times the big blind plus one for every limper. If my hand is not in the strong raising range, then I'm going to determine if it's in the limp behind range, which is two ranges higher than my base range. So if my hand is not in the strong raising range, which is five ranges higher, but it is in the limp behind range, which is two ranges higher, then I should, uh, you guessed it, I should limp behind. And then finally, if it's not in that either of those ranges, and if I determined initially that it is in the playable range, then I know that I'm in my weak raising range spot and I should be raising to that two and a half times the big blind plus one for every limper. So uh, that's sort of the approach. And again, we covered that in more detail last week. And once you get high enough, the system will have you raising over limpers with your entire playable range, which happens when the base range hits uh, range 77. So consider what this means for each base range if there's at least one limper in front and assuming our hand is within the base range. So range 22 on the button, I'm going if there's limpers in front of me, I'm going to raise if it's in range 77 and limp behind if it's range 44, else raise if it's in that range 22. And that keeps going up each time. So for example, uh, if I'm in range 44, so if I'm two off the button, I look down and I realize my hand is in range 44. So it's a playable hand. Then there's limpers in front of me. Now I know I'm going to split my range. Then I look and say, okay, is it in range 99? If yes, I'm going to raise. If not, I ask, is it in range 66? If yes, I'm going to limp. If not, I'm going to raise. So that's how that whole process works. And in terms of frequencies, uh, what it means is that I'm still playing the hand as much as I was before when there was no action, but now it's split. So if I think of the raise, call, fold frequencies by position, when there's a limper in front of me in an early tournament, uh, I've got a grid here that I'll share at some point, but basically on the button, I'm going to be raising 19% of the time that I play and calling behind or limping behind 10% of the time. So I'm still playing 29% of the time, but now I'm skewed more toward raising than calling. And as we go down through that, 
uh, it's basically split 50-50 between raise and call um, for those hands that I'm going to be playing until I get to uh, range 55 or so. At that point, it's going to be heavily weighted toward raising, and by the time I hit uh, range 66, um, or by the time I hit range 77, if I'm playing the hand, it's coming in for a raise over limpers. But if you follow that general framework of the plus five range to raise, the plus two range to limp, and then everything else within that core range to raise, you'll automatically have those percentages working for you. Okay, so that's a pretty long recap, but I wanted to reiterate because I think the language is getting cleaner uh, as we go each time. So let's look now at if there's a raise in front of us. And certainly there's going to be more to consider here around stack sizes, a player type, bet size, the history of that player and responding to three betting, what they tend to do in terms of continuation betting, etc. And so as we get deeper into these situations, there are more and more variables that make our action uh, and it depends sort of spot. But that does not mean that we can't have default ranges on what to do when facing a raise in front of us. So let me reiterate again that I'm trying to develop a structure that may not be optimal, but it's strategically sound and will help improve the play of most recreational players. Uh, enhancements are always going to be part of this, but without making it something that can be implemented by a recreational player, if it's just too complex, complicated, or hard to remember, then I'm not sure how much value it really is. So again, in this situation with the raise in front of me, I'm making some simplifications to allow the strategy to be implementable broadly. So this means continuing to use the same core eight strategies as much as possible. So in this situation, I'm going to use the same logical structure as when there are limpers in front. This means I'm going to use the idea of figuring out if you're going to play the hand or not, and if so, determining a strong raising range, a call behind range, and a weak raising range. The difference here is with a raise in front of us, we're going to compress everything. We're going to have a tighter playing range, and then everything is going to be compressed. We're not going to play as wide as we would have if it was folded to us or if there were limpers in front of us. Now we've tightened up a bit. So what we need to do is really figure out well, what is that range that's playable still, and then how do we break that into those three categories of raise, call behind, and raise. So the system works like this. Uh, determine the new playable range. So rather than the core range that's normally associated with that spot, the new playable range is three ranges higher than your position-based base range. So if I'm on the button, the base range is range 22, but if there's a raise in front of me, the new playable range becomes range 55. And now if my hand is outside of that playable range, then I'm going to fold regardless of what else happens if there's a raise in front of me. However, if my hand is in this new adjusted playable range, then I need to do the following things in order. First of all, ask if it's in the strong raising range. And in this case, my strong raising range is always going to be range 99, regardless of the position. So I'm always going to raise, which means I'm going to three bet over the initial raiser with pocket nines and higher, suited cards, both queen and higher, and unsuited ace-king. So that's going to be my strong raising range in all situations, okay? Um, so the, the size of the three bet can vary quite a bit depending on a number of factors, but I think a good general rule is to raise two and a half to three times their bet size. So if the blinds are 50, 100, and somebody raises to 300 and I have pocket queens, I would recommend a raise somewhere between 750 and 900. Uh, but we can talk about bet sizing later. But the point is, um, if I've got a, a range 99 hand, I'm going to three bet over a raiser from every position. Okay, so what if I don't have a range 99 hand? What if I don't have something in that strong raising range? Then I need to determine what is the call behind range. And I do that by determining what is that range one range higher than the playability range that I've already established, which, which the playability range is already three ranges higher than the core range. So for example, if I'm on the button and there's a raise in front of me, I've determined that the playable range is no longer range 22, it's now range 55. Uh, and then my strong raising range is range 99. 
But if my playable range is range 55, uh, then the call behind range is range 66. So if my hand is not in range 99, and it is in range 66, then I should call behind. Now, finally, if, if I determined initially that my hand is in this new playable range, like on the button if it's in range 55, but it's not in the strong raising range of range 99, and it's not in the call behind range, in this case range 66, then it is in the weak raising range, and my polarized raising strategy says I need to raise that standard size of two and a half to three times the initial raise. Now in this system, once you get high enough, and it happens fairly quick, the system will have you re-raising with your entire playable range. Uh, because um, once your base range is 55, uh, three ranges above that is range 88, and anything above that is range 99. So at this point, um, you have, uh, you're have you raising with everything that's in those ranges. So let's look at each of the each of these uh, ranges. So if, if you're on the button, which is normally core range 22, and somebody raises, you're now looking at a playable range of 55, which means you're going to re-raise if your hand is in range 99. If not, you're going to call if it's in range 66. Otherwise, you're going to re-raise if it is in 55. If you're one off the button, so your core range is normally 33, your now playable range is range 66. Here, if your hand is in range 99, you're going to re-raise. If it's range 77, you're going to call. Else, if it's in range 66, you're going to call or you're going to re-raise there with your low, weak raising range. You move two off the button. So you're normally range 44. There's a raise in front of you. So now you're looking at playable range 77. So if you're in range 77, you're going to play this hand. You say, okay, are we at range 99, which is my my top end re-raising range. If yes, then re-raise. If not, then your calling behind range is 88. It's one higher. So you'll call there if you're range 88. If you're not, then you should re-raise here because you're at the at your low re-raising range. And then as you get higher in there, once you're in the standard range 55 and higher, you're either going to play it with a re-raise or you're going to fold it based on this approach. So if I look at that and I look at, okay, what are the frequencies here? Um, our total number of hands played shrinks up pretty significantly by about three ranges. So the way to think about that is because we're now going three ranges higher in terms of playability, we play on the button when there's a raise in front of us what we would normally play from the low jack or three positions over. And that range... Uh, at least in late position, is split between a polarized raising strategy and a call behind strategy. So given this system, here are the raise call fold frequencies by position when there's a raise in front of us early in a tournament. So when we are on the button and there's a raise in front of us, we're going to end up raising 7% of the time, calling 13% of the time, and folding 80% of the time. When we're in the cutoff, we will end up 3-bet raising 10% of the time, calling 8% of the time, and folding 82% of the time. When we're in the hijack, we'll be raising 9%, calling only 3%, and folding 88%. When we are in the low jack, or three spots off of the button, here we're going to be 3-betting 8% of the time, we will never be calling, and we'll be folding 92% of the time. And as we get further from the button, as we hit four off the button and all the way up to under the gun 10-handed, at that point, the frequencies are all the same. We're going to be three betting 5% of the time and folding 95% of the time. That's how it's going to work. And I think it works out well because, you know, the if we're in an earlier position and there's a raise in front of us, they're raising from earlier position, which we have to give more respect, assuming they're a player that is not... Uh, that is not just raising with any two cards in any position, but they're actually positionally aware, they should have a tighter range. So we should also have a tighter three betting range, at least early in the tournament um, when we're still generally in the preservation mode. So if I look at this, my first impression is that it might be a bit tight, uh, but do remember that we can adjust based on the players and the table dynamics. 
And also remember, it's in the early stage of a tournament. And for me, I am willing to get involved in good spots, but I'm generally trying to reduce volatility during the stage. So getting involved in a raised pot with a marginal hand is not something that I am looking to do. So that is my strategy. Uh, I didn't have time to put it together early enough to get reactions from all of you. So instead, what I'm going to do is send this entire strategy uh, um, to many of you to get feedback and then potentially make some tweaks before coming back to you with what I consider my final working vision. Uh, so feel free to give me feedback on this. Also, I have a long way to go, but maybe you can help direct the next episodes. Do I start talking about playing out of the blinds early in tournaments? Uh, do I move on to how to adjust these strategies as the tournament moves forward to uh, future phases? Uh, or do we just let these settle? Uh, some of us try these out for a while, report back with feedback, and uh, once we've used them a bit. Uh, and if we do that, we can move a different direction. Maybe we do another round of interviews. Maybe we share some of the things that I've been learning from the Rec Poker training content providers, which is amazing, by the way. Um, so who knows where we go. Uh, I'm, I kind of want to see what the feedback is on this and decide if I'm going to keep pushing forward or take a break uh, and then come back to this once uh, we've had a chance to use this. But anyway, thank you for joining me on the journey. It's definitely an interesting effort to take something so complex and bring it down to something with a simple foundation of default plays. And, and I do agree there's much value lurking on the adjustments and the margins, but having a core strategy that we can work with and adjust as we go is going to be critical for at least my personal growth as a poker player. So with that, uh, that's the end of the content. Again, you can sign off if you want, but I do have a couple of updates on what's happening with Rec Poker Training. Um, so stick around if you want to hear about some of that. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got our first live seminars coming up on Saturday, November 10th. We have one from 8 to 11 a.m. and one from noon to 3 p.m. Each one is three hours long. And we're going to be meeting at a hotel in Lino Lakes, uh, which is just south of Running Aces. So it's fairly convenient there for those of you who play at Running Aces anyway. And the seminar in November, I'm going to call Approaching a Tournament. And it's really going to be about how do we prepare for and how do we think about playing a tournament. And the primary content is going to be this phenomenal 45-minute video by Matt Hunt, who's part of the Solve for Why Academy. This is part of their premium content that they're willing to let me show you guys, uh, which is great. Uh, and this video is called Anatomy of an MTT. And this is where you'll hear me use that word preservation phase. It's one of his six phases that he outlines when he considers that. So that'll be the primary video, and then we'll have some discussion around that. And then we're going to look at a list out of a presentation that I received from Alex Assassinato Fitzgerald, another great presentation, super long, phenomenal. For this uh, seminar, I'm just going to show you one of the lists, and we can talk about that as a group, see what you guys think of that. And then we're going to end by watching part one of this uh, video series from the Solve for Why Academy called Poker Out Loud, which is just fascinating. Uh, it's five of these, or five or six of these great poker players, including Matt Berkey, Christian Soto, Jordan Young. And they're playing with noise canceling headphones and music on. So then before they act, they, they share their thought process about the hands. And they're showing every hand in this. Um, this series of videos, but they edit it to make it uh, make it flow much better. But I found it super fascinating. So we'll look at just part one of that. It's pretty short, like eight to ten minutes. Uh, we'll have a little bit of time for discussion, but it's mostly just an interesting video for you guys to to take a look at. And so these seminars are limited to thirty people at each session. I want to keep them small enough that we can have some good discussion and start to build Rec Poker Nation and build our community. Um, and so you can reserve your spot. I've already sold a few. Um, so if you, uh, let me know, you get a hold of me, Steve at recpokertraining.com. Let me know which one you want. I'll give you instructions as far as how you can pay for that. And once you're paid, you're locked in. And then I'll start, uh, giving you some details as we get closer. We're going to create a, a shared document for anybody that's been at a session to kind of continue the conversation as well. So feel free to reach out to me in some way if you want to reserve your spot, but I am going to cap it at 30 people per session. Uh, one other thing related to that, though, uh, if you have a group of people, uh, you know, a regular home game, or if you have um, some other group of people that you want to get together and have this seminar 
given to you guys as a private group, I can do that. I have the uh, the permission from the Solve for Y Academy as well as Alex Fitzgerald to share that with private groups as well. So we can work that out. I'm happy to come to wherever you are and share that, whether it's a full three hours or we do a partial one. Uh, we can work through the details on what that looks like. I promise I will do what I can to make that as affordable as possible to you guys. So let me know on that. I think that's kind of a fun way for everybody to learn together. Um, and also, if you have other things that you want me to, to help out with, I'm happy to like deal to your home game and and uh, share commentary on what I see on certain plays and opportunities that were missed and that kind of thing. Happy to do that as well. Another thing that we have coming, uh, we got to work out the details on the date, uh, but I'm going to have a player panel uh, Q&A. Uh, so this is going to be at least once a month where I have... Uh, good recreational players that are well-respected, well-regarded, and they just do an online Q&A. So I would solicit questions ahead of time. I'd consolidate those, give those to the panelists, and they would answer those during this two-hour session. But also you could actually ask questions real-time, and we'll get to as many as possible. I'm planning on making that two-hour session available for $20. Uh, but if you're part of um, our Patreon-supporting family at at least a $20 a month level, uh, you can access that absolutely free. So uh, you can do it uh, ad hoc, 20 bucks, or you can uh, be part of the Patreon supporting family and you get that free as one of the benefits for your support. So I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to be a really uh, good opportunity to build community again, uh, as well as to get some direct information and get the questions that you have directly answered uh, by a very, very uh, capable player. Another thing that I'm, I'm launching, and this is part of uh, Patreon support, is um, I'm, I'm starting to gather data from those of you who want me to collect your data. And um, every month, if you support us at at least the $5 a month level, I'm going to share with you uh, the aggregate results in terms of how we're doing as a group, uh, but also give you some insights as far as how ROI and in the money are related, that sort of thing. But just kind of high level reporting on uh, what's happening uh, to help you gauge where you're at. That would just be a consolidated perspective. But uh, as you support us at a $20 a month level, uh, you're invited to actually submit all of your historical data. I would provide you with a very easy template and you could submit all of your historical data or just kind of on a go forward basis. Uh, give me your data. And then what I would do is I would do some analysis on your specific data and give you some insights regarding your data but also do analytics on the group as well and be able to compare your data to the group's data and hopefully give you some insight uh, into um, how data could help you adjust your strategy a little bit or where you're seeing the most success. Maybe it's qualifiers versus tournaments or home games versus casino or maybe your rebuy in the money is, is really small or maybe it's really big and what does that tell us about your game? All of those sorts of analytics we can do as we start collecting data. So that will that will morph into uh, more specifics as we go. But uh, my background is in analytics. I'm an actuary. I'm a capital market hedger. I'm a uh, HR analytics and MBA. Uh, so this is what I do. And I think um, using this data to draw insights and inferences uh, can be incredibly helpful, both at a at a high level aggregate view as well as you individually. And then also um, email coaching. So I've had a few people ask about this. Obviously, uh, I'm not at the level where I'm going to be charging $200, $800 an hour for personal lessons. But if you want to do some email coaching, you can support us on Patreon. And at certain levels, uh, I will give you up to an hour a week of just emailing back and forth about uh, any questions that you have. I can provide my insight, but I can also uh, provide insight that I'm learning from others. I can also link you to other resources that I'm aware of, uh, free content that might be available or things that I have access to that I can maybe help you out with. So uh, if you want to do that, I think that could be incredibly powerful. Um, it ends up working out to maybe be 10 bucks an hour or something pretty cheap. So uh, if that's something you want to do, uh, check it out. So the way that these get paid for is uh, you can support us on Patreon, support Rec Poker on Patreon. If you don't, that's perfectly fine. You can purchase uh, some of these things kind of a one-off basis, like the seminars and the, the Q&A player profile or uh, panel, that sort of stuff you can just buy as you want. But you can also support us on a monthly basis and, and get different uh, benefits there. So you can support us for as little as $1 a month. Uh, there aren't any benefits of the $1 a month other than you know you're being part of this and supporting me and encouraging me, and that's a great benefit to me. Um, but once you start supporting at the $5 a month level, we call that the bronze level, uh, you'd get a thank you on the podcast for becoming a new supporter. You'd get those monthly consolidated reports. 
and we'll give you a 5% discount on any study groups or seminars, both live and online. Uh, once you get up to the $20 a month level, we'll call that our silver level. Uh, you get all the stuff from the bronze level, but you also can now submit your personal data to be analyzed uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, and I'll give you those quarterly reports on both individual as well as collective data. You also receive live access to the player panel Q&A, that thing that we normally charge 20 bucks for, you would get for free. And now you get 10% discounts on any of the other seminars, uh, et cetera, study groups, that kind of thing. At the $60 a month level, you get all that other stuff, plus you get one-on-one -on -one email coaching, and now your discount jumps to 20%. And then at our highest level, the $100 a month platinum level, here you get all the benefits uh, that we've talked about before, and now you'll get free access to all the study groups, all the seminars, both live and online. So that's how the support level works. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions on that, let me know. I'm trying to provide as much information as I can pretty quickly, so it's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, but as always, I'm accessible. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, or if you see anything that looks out of line, just let me know. Uh, I think there's a lot of options. We're going to add stuff as we get rolling. Um, I just have a ton of ideas on, on what to do. Uh, but the other thing is if you really want to stay updated, I, I do want to get off of giving all of these updates on the podcast. I know that's annoying. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing is transferring that to an email newsletter, probably weekly, probably uh, also do some blogging on the website. So if you want to stay plugged in, probably the easiest way to do that is sign up for the, uh, for the email list. Uh, and as I mentioned at the front end, you can just go to recpokertraining.com. We have that spot where you can sign up for the newsletter on the bottom of that homepage. Just put in your email. Uh, and once you do that, uh, you are going to be getting a, a free gift as a, as a thank you. Uh, we have a 115-page poker workbook, volume one, featuring 15 interactive poker hand quizzes from Jonathan Little. Uh, he was gracious enough to give us that as a gift to give to you if you sign up for the Rec Poker newsletter. So I think that's a good gift, and that's going to be the best way for you to stay plugged in so you don't need to listen to my rambling voice at the end of all these episodes. Uh, I'll probably just do this. Uh, maybe this is the last time, maybe one more time. Otherwise, just direct you to the website and the newsletter. But I wanted to, to get it out there uh, in case you hadn't heard uh, about these things. So that's that. Uh, final reminders. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's fun to see the Rec Poker Nation growing and uh, the encouragement and the momentum behind it. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, where this is going in the next step, um, next chapter of this thing. A lot of really cool stuff. Thank you to Running Aces, our official sponsor. Reminder, uh, man, go out to iTunes, like us, comment, rate and review us, subscribe, tell other people. That's phenomenal. I appreciate that so much. Go to patreon.com slash rec poker to support what we're doing. Get some of those benefits. Unlock those benefits. Uh, if you want to wear a patch, let me know. If you want hats, shirts, sweatshirts, go to floptheworld.com slash rec poker. And if you have any feedback ever, email me, Facebook, Twitter, uh, okay, so that is it for today. Thanks for hanging in there. Hope this strategy stuff helps. I love your feedback. Let me know if this is good, bad, or ugly. Uh, otherwise, we will chat with you next week. Adios. Adios.